Aladdin's mother prostrated herself a second time before the Sultan's throne and retired. On her way home, she laughed within herself at her son's foolish imagination. Where, said she, can he get so many large gold trays, and such precious stones to fill them? <laughs> it is altogether out of his power, and I believe he will not be much pleased with my embassy this time. When she came home full of these thoughts, she told Aladdin all the circumstances of her interview with the Sultan, and the conditions on which he consented to the marriage. "'The Sultan expects your answer immediately,' said she, and then added, laughing, "'I believe he may wait long enough.' "'Not so long, mother, as you imagine,' replied Aladdin. "'This demand is a mere trifle, and will prove no bar to my marriage with the princess. I will prepare at once to satisfy his request.' Aladdin retired to his own apartment and summoned the genie of the lamp, and required him to prepare and present the gift immediately before the sultan closed his morning audience, according to the terms in which it had been prescribed. The genie professed his obedience to the owner of the lamp and disappeared. Within a very short time, a train of forty black slaves, led by the same number of white slaves, appeared opposite the house in which Aladdin lived. Each black slave carried on his head a basin of massy gold, full of pearls, diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. Aladdin then addressed his mother. Madam, pray lose no time. Before the sultan and the divan rise, I would have you return to the palace with this present, as the dowry demanded for the princess, that he may judge by my diligence and exactness of the ardent and sincere desire I have to procure myself the honor of this alliance. As soon as this magnificent procession, with Aladdin's mother at its head, had begun to march from Aladdin's house, the whole city was filled with the crowds of people desirous to see so grand a sight. The graceful bearing, elegant form, and wonderful likeness of each slave, their grave walk at an equal distance from each other, the luster of their jeweled girdles and the brilliancy of the aigrets of precious stones in their turbans excited the greatest admiration in the spectators. As they had to pass through several streets to the palace, the whole length of the way was lined with files of spectators. Nothing indeed was ever seen so beautiful and brilliant as these slaves, whom they supposed to be kings. As the sultan, who had been informed of their approach, had given orders for them to be admitted, they met with no obstacle, but went into the divan in regular order, one part turning to the right and the other to the left. After they were all entered and had formed a semicircle before the sultan's throne, the black slaves laid the golden trays on the carpet, prostrated themselves, touching the carpet with their foreheads, and at the same time the white slaves did the same. When they rose, the black slaves uncovered the trays and then all stood with their arms crossed over their breasts. In the meantime, Aladdin's mother advanced to the foot of the throne, and having prostrated herself, said to the sultan, Sire, my son knows this present is much below the notice of Princess Budir al-Budur, but hopes, nevertheless, that your majesty will accept of it and make it agreeable to the princess, and with a greater confidence, since he has endeavored to conform to the conditions you were pleased to impose. The sultan, overpowered at the sight of such more than royal magnificence, replied without hesitation to the words of Aladdin's mother. Go, and tell your son that I wait with open arms to embrace him. And the more haste he makes to come and receive the princess, my daughter, from my hands, the greater pleasure he will do me. As soon as Aladdin's mother had retired, the sultan put an end to the audience, and rising from his throne, ordered that the princess's attendants should come and carry the trays into their mistress's apartment whither he went himself to examine them with her at his leisure. The fourscore slaves were conducted into the palace, and the sultan, telling the princess of their magnificent apparel, ordered them to be brought before her apartment, that she might see through the lattices he had not exaggerated in his account of them. 
In the meantime, Aladdin's mother reached home and showed in her air and countenance the good news she brought to her son. My son, said she, you may rejoice you are arrived at the height of your desires. The Sultan has declared that you shall marry the Princess Budir al Budur. He waits for you with impatience. Aladdin, enraptured with this news, made his mother very little reply, but retired to his chamber. There he rubbed his lamp and the obedient genie appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, convey me at once to a bath and supply me with the richest and most magnificent robe ever worn by a monarch. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the genie rendered him, as well as himself, invisible, and transported him into a bath of the finest marble of all sorts of colors, where he was undressed, without seeing by whom, in a magnificent and spacious hall. He was then well rubbed and washed with various scented waters. After he had passed through several degrees of heat, he came out quite a different man from what he was before. His skin was clear as that of a child, his body lightsome and free, and when he returned into the hall, he found, instead of his own poor raiment, a robe, the magnificence of which astonished him. The genie helped him to dress, and when he had done, transported him back to his own chamber, where he asked him if he had any other commands. Yes, answered Aladdin. Bring me a charger that surpasses in beauty and goodness the best in the sultan's stables, with a saddle, bridle, and other caparisons to correspond with his value. Furnish also twenty slaves, as richly clothed as those who carried the present to the sultan, to walk by my side and follow me, and twenty more to go before me in two ranks. Besides these, bring my mother six women slaves to attend her, as richly dressed at least as any of the Princess Budir al Budur's, each carrying a complete dress fit for any sultaness. I want also ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. Go and make haste. As soon as Aladdin had given these orders, the genie disappeared, but presently returned with the horse, the forty slaves, ten of whom carried each a purse containing ten thousand pieces of gold and six women slaves, each carrying on her head a different dress for Aladdin's mother, wrapped up in a piece of silver tissue, and presented them all to Aladdin. He presented the six women slaves to his mother, telling her that they were her slaves, and that the dresses they had brought were for her use. Of the ten purses, Aladdin took four, which he gave to his mother, telling her those were to supply her with necessaries. The other six he left in the hands of the slaves who brought them, with an order to throw them by handfuls among the people as they went to the sultan's palace. The six slaves who carried the purses he ordered likewise to march before him, three on the right hand and three on the left. When Aladdin had thus prepared himself for his first interview with the sultan, he dismissed the genie, and immediately mounting his charger began his march. And though he never was on horseback before, appeared with a grace the most experienced horseman might envy. The innumerable concourse of people through whom he passed made the air echo with their acclamations, especially every time the six slaves who carried the purses threw handfuls of gold among the populace. On Aladdin's arrival at the palace, the sultan was surprised to find him more richly and magnificently robed than he had ever been himself, and was impressed with his good looks and dignity of manner which were so different from what he expected in the son of one so humble as Aladdin's mother. He embraced him with all the demonstrations of joy, and when he would have fallen at his feet, held him by the hand and made him sit near his throne. He shortly after led him amidst the sounds of trumpets, hoboys, and all kinds of music to a magnificent entertainment, at which the sultan and Aladdin ate by themselves, and the great lords of the court, according to their rank and dignity, sat at different tables. After the feast, the sultan sent for the chief Qadi, and commanded him to draw up a contract of marriage between the princess Budir al-Budur and Aladdin. When the contract had been drawn, the sultan asked Aladdin if he would stay in the palace and complete the ceremonies of the marriage that day. Sire, said Aladdin, 
Though great is my impatience to enter on the honor granted me by your majesty, yet I beg you to permit me first to build a palace worthy to receive the princess your daughter. I pray you to grant me sufficient ground near your palace, and I will have it completed with the utmost expedition. The sultan granted Aladdin his request, and again embraced him after which he took his leave with as much politeness as if he had been bred up and had always lived at court.